Our next speaker is Robert Mullins. He's Associate Professor of Biblical Studies at Azusa Pacific University here in California. And he's the co-director with uh, Nava Panitz Cohen of the Hebrew University of the New Excavations at Tel Abel Beit Ma'aka. So please, he will be speaking on the emergence of Israel in retrospect. Bob. Thank you very much. Boy, that's a hard act to follow, Aaron. Excellent presentation. Uh, I have to say mine is much more mundane, um, but I do hope that um, I'll have some things to contribute. Okay. In the year 1208-1207 BCE, Merneptah made a momentous campaign to Canaan, where he subjugated a people called Israel, probably in the central highlands of Palestine. Who were, were, who were they? Where did they come from? What is the relationship between Israel of the Merneptah Stila and Israel of the Hebrew Bible? Three models that have been put forth to explain the appearance of Israel in the highlands of Canaan um, are conquest pastoral sedentarization, and social revolt. The first theory, the traditional model of a unified military conquest, is based mainly on an uncritical reading of the book of Joshua, combined with some evidence for the destruction of late Bronze Age sites at the end of the 13th century. At one time vigorously defended by William Foxwell Albright and G. Ernest Wright, this model has been largely discredited by recent archaeology, even though it remains the dominant view in religious circles. The other two models of pastoral sedentarization and social revolt have been critiqued in various ways, though not to the extent of the conquest, and they continue to exist in a number of variants that are actually more complementary than mutually exclusive. In my view, pastoral groups must have been a part of Israel's ethnogenesis, whether originating from the highland region itself, as Israel Finkelstein has argued, or infiltrating from outside in the form of nomadic groups like the Shasu, as Anson Rainey has, uh, has argued, and I believe um, Avi will also um, um, argue um, in his presentation that follows, or perhaps even both. In the case of the social revolt theory, scholars have been skeptical of its reductionist Marxist undertones. Indeed, the existence of unfortified Iron One villages seems to speak against the notion of social revolt. That said, given the instability of the times, this model might explain part of what was going on at the time. What is more important for us today is the overall archaeological evidence pointing to the indigenous character of the emerging highland population um, to account for the kind of growth that takes place in the hill country in the 12th century, it would make sense to include both farmers and pastoral groups as part of the general population. One weakness of all three theories is that they have tended to focus on the boundaries of biblical Israel and thus ignore what was happening in neighboring regions at the same time. Now, this is less true with central Transjordan, where scholars have long noted similarities in pottery and architecture with that found in the Western Highlands. Less attention has been devoted to Lebanon and Syria. Part of the reason for this is the continued lack of good archaeological data. Much of what we know about the Lebanese Bekaa, for example, is limited to surveys. There are some excavated sites there, but most of, much of what we know is limited to surveys, like those carried out by Marfo, Kushka, and Bonatz. Southern Syria is still largely terra incognita, though the discovery of late Bronze Age pillared houses at Tel Saqqa, southeast of Damascus, does recall the late Bronze Age pillared house at Tel Batash in the Sork Valley. These late bronze examples, though few in number, may serve as early examples of the kind of structure that would, have, that would become common throughout the Levant during the Iron Age. So it seems to me that some of the trends noted for the southern Levant might be applicable to parts of the northern Levant as well. In the end, what is sorely needed is a much more comprehensive, multifactored um, explanation such as that required by any complex historical phenomenon. A fourth model put forth in various forms uh, by Larry Steger, by Lemke, uh, de Goyce, has been referred to as the dissolution model. 
It has the advantage of not excluding any of the previous models, yet provides a more explanatory basis for how these changes came about. Among the contributing factors it looks at is the disintegrating role of Egyptian power in the Levant, hastened in part by the Sea Peoples and the impact of climate. To put these changes into perspective, we need to back up three centuries to the time of the 18th dynasty, when Egypt maintained more or less a non-interventionist policy in Asia. For the most part, the Egyptians were interested in securing their interest in Canaan against the hurrying kingdom of Mitanni and milking the country economically. Indeed, it worked to the advantage of Egypt that the entire Eastern Mediterranean had become a vast nexus of international and interdependent trade. For the most part, Egypt interfered only when they felt their authority was threatened, a policy that contributed to the social and political circumstances alluded to in the Amarna letters, which we heard about uh, earlier today, and mistakenly used by some to support an early date conquest or as evidence for a social revolution. It is important to remember that the Amarna letters are a selective presentation of events. Moreover, the chaotic social times that we read about not only affected southern Canaan, but impacted Lebanon as well, as far north as the Homs Gap on the plain of Akar. So the social and political unrest as depicted in the Amarna letters is much broader than just Palestine. Political circumstances changed quite dramatically in the 13th century, when there was a clear buildup of Egyptian presence and influence in Canaan under the Ramesides during the 19th dynasty. This shift in strategy was largely the result of Hittite activity in the north, but it had a profound impact on the social fabric of Canaan at the time. This change is quite visible in the archaeological record. Sites in southern Canaan, for example, uh, in this uh, region here, uh, along the coastal plain, and also in the inland valleys, um, show signs of increased Egyptian presence and influence, including the emulation of Egyptian pottery in the local Canaanite assemblage. Politically and economically, this must have been a time of great hardship on the local population. And as Mario Liverani has pointed out, these circumstances may have caused Canaanites living on the coastal plain, the most important access route for Egypt northwards, to relocate to the sparser hills in the east, providing a population nucleus for what would later become Israel, but still largely invisible in the archaeological record. All of this is part of a protracted process that began roughly a century earlier, when the Libyans first made incursions into the western delta in the time of Seti I, around 1300 BCE. The Libyans must have had compelling reasons to travel some 1,200 kilometers to the Egyptian delta, most scholars think they were probably spurred on by food shortages. Indeed, Merneptah mentions drought as a factor, along with a population increase. The issue of drought is an important one. Like theories of migration, archaeologists today have a tendency to, to dismiss climatic factors as decisive in historical change and have placed greater stress on internal changes and socioeconomic processes. But in this instance, Hittite and Ugaritic texts mention famines and the importation of grain from Syria to Anatolia. So climate should be a factor that one takes into account during this time. Seti's son, Ramses II, also fought the Libyans. And then around 1208, Merneptha fought off a significant Libyan invasion, as recounted in the Merneptha Stila. The pharaoh managed to keep the Libyans and their sea people allies, the Sheridan, Teresh and Sheklish at bay until the time of Ramses III, around 1180, 1175, when they returned in force. This series of events indicates that climatic conditions may have helped set the stage for a large-scale movement of people, including the Libyans and Sea Peoples, in search of food and suitable areas to colonize. It also contributed to a gradual weakening of Egyptian power in the region. With a significant advance of the Sea Peoples in the time of Merneptha and Ramses III, we witness a total collapse of the major Late Bronze Age kingdoms and city-states, along with the continued erosion of Egyptian power to the point where they eventually withdraw from Canaan by 1130 BCE. 
In its wake, we witnessed the appearance of smaller nations to fill the vacuum. These not only included the Israelites and the Philistines, but the Phoenicians, Arameans, and Ammonites as well. Such upheaval and political uncertainty must have affected the trade system and created economic crises that forced people to relocate. Not only was the urban elite dependent on interregional and regional trade for their livelihood, but various nomadic, banded, and peasant groups were also dependent on this exchange as well. As a result, such rural groups would have become increasingly independent. In the words of Coote and Whiteland, the expansion of agricultural settlements in the highlands and the exploitation of more marginal areas was a mean of, quote unquote, risk reduction by the shift to and the expansion of agriculture and pastoralism following the general economic collapse. A similar pattern occurred at the end of EB3 with the collapse of the urban centers and a shift to pastoral and village life. And in his survey of Upper Galilee, uh, Rafi Frankel noted the rise of many small Iron Age villages following the demise of Hatsur at the end of the Late Bronze Age. Steger has also made an attractive conjecture, which would explain why nomads were also included in this process. The marked decline in trade, which took place at the close of the Late Bronze Age, robbed them of important elements of their source of income, so that they were now dependent on regular agriculture. In short, it is the farming and shepherd population of Palestine that freed itself from dependence on the old urban system that formed the group identified as Israel. According to Rainer Alberts, the Exodus group, whoever they may be, landed in the midst of this process of change. And if they are the ones who brought worship of Yahweh with them, then they made a significant contribution towards creating a new social order. Thus, uh, to borrow an apt phrase by Israel Finkelstein in a slightly different context, we must understand that, and I quote, the rise of early Israel was an outcome of the collapse of Canaanite society, not the reason for that collapse. The possibility of an outside group bringing in the belief in Yahweh has some support. Um, Anson Rainey, who argued that the later people of Israel arose from the Shasu of Edom and the Negev Highlands, um, appealed to four factors. Uh, the biblical tradition of entrance from Transjordan, a lack of further references to the Shasu in Iron One, uh, older texts like Deuteronomy 33 and Judges 5, which describe Yahweh as coming from Sinai, a region that's paralleled with Seir and Paran. He also argued for grammatical similarities between Hebrew, Aramaic, and Moabite. Scholars have also pointed to Egyptian lists from the time of Amenhotep III and Ramses II that mentioned the Tashasu Yahweh, where Yahu is a geographic or ethnic designation in southern Palestine and Edom. While still debated, a number of scholars believe there may be a relationship between this Yahu and Yahweh. At the beginning of my talk, I mentioned the Merneptah Stila, historically important as the extra-biblical reference, earliest extra-biblical extra reference to a people called Israel. It is also worth noting that the lack of any reference to the Philistines in the Merneptah Stila, even though Ashkelon is well known to us as a Philistine city, is a good indication that this campaign takes place before the Philistines settle on the southern coastal plain. Most scholars place this Israel in a geographic region that might be more narrowly defined as the Samaria Arch, or more broadly extending to the entire hill country. I tend to favor the former, the more kind of northern part of the hill country, since the survey data identifies the earliest settlements in this area. Moreover, according to the biblical tradition, these are the territories of Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Joseph, who is the favored son of Jacob, also known as Israel. Whatever the historical basis for the traditions preserved in the ancestral narratives, it's hard to ignore the correspondence between the name Israel and the northern part of the hill country as being the earlier and more populated zone. The initial appearance of Merneptah's Israel as Canaanites shifting from the lowlands to the highlands might be supported by the results of archaeological excavations at Isbet Sarta, Hirbet Radana, and Gilo, which date them to the late 13th century. However, the dating of many other hill country villages is problematic, since much of what we know is obtained through surface survey, 
So a better understanding of their date of uh, found, founding and pattern of settlement will have to await further excavation, a full excavation. Nevertheless, it is still significant in my mind that these unfortified villages begin to appear in the late 13th century, appropriate to the time of Merneptah's campaign. Botanical and faunal remains indicate that the Highland Center settlers were farmers with a pastoral component, depending on where the site was located. The bones of sheep, goat, cattle, and donkey predominate. There is a remarkable consistency among all of these population groups in the type of house. All of them belong to the pillared variety. There is also the use of colored rim jars, terraced agriculture, and slake lime cisterns. While it was once believed that these were all Israelite innovations, the pillared house and collared rim jars have roots in the late Bronze Age, and terraced agriculture and the use of cisterns go back to the Middle Bronze Age. So the te technology was already known and established. There's also good support from sites outside the boundaries of biblical Israel. Collared rim jars show up um, at Sahab, uh, in Transjordan, Tel Der Allah, Phase A, also Tel El Mazar, and Hirbet El Hajar. Pillared houses have been excavated at Sahab, at Tel El Umeri, and at Hirbet Al Mudena on the southern Moabite Plateau. Uh, this summer, my colleague Nava Panitz Cohen and I will start a new archaeological project at Avel Beit Macha a site which Chaim Tadmor, Nadab Naaman, and others have argued is Aramean in the early Iron Age, and possibly the capital of Aram Macha, known from Joshua 13 and 2 Samuel 10. In our survey last May, we found the rim fragment of a collared rim jar in an Iron One context. If indeed the city was Aramean at the time, it might indicate that Arameans also made use of this vessel. How the various highland groups coalesced and came to be called Israel isn't known. Though if there is some kernel of historical truth behind the various battles and judges uh, ref as reflective of the times, perhaps the need to fight against surrounding enemies contributed to a bond that united them. Uh, Rainer Alberts claims that the name Israel means, meant something like El rules. Moreover, the name of Israel presupposes a time when the population believed in God as El, the high Canaanite God. Could such a designation have been used to both unify and express dissatisfaction with Egyptian rule? Note that the divine name here is not Yahweh, but El. Even though El can be the generic name for deity in the Semitic languages, there are good reasons to regard this as El, the chief deity of the Canaanite pantheon. Supporting this view are over 500 place names in the Hebrew Bible, none of which are Yahwistic. Toponyms are important because they identify the various deities worshipped in Canaan. Place names include about a half dozen deities. El, Baal, Astarte, Anat, Shemesh, Yerach, and Anat. None of them, however, is Yahweh, suggesting that I, Yahweh was either a minor deity in the Canaanite pantheon or perhaps had roots from the outside. Um, it should be worth pointing out that not only Yahweh of Israel, but also Kamosh of Moab and Kaus of Edom had no known roles in the pantheon of Canaan. In conclusion, we have a complex interaction of events taking place during the late bronze iron one transition. Indigenous Canaanites moving to the hills uh, share territory with, um, um, uh, share territory uh, with pastoralists, as well as infiltration of pastoralists from Transjordan or the southern deserts. Perhaps the Hebrew Bible retains some of this memory, not only by people moving westward from Chan's Jordan into the Western Highlands, where they came into conflict with the indigenous population, memorialized particularly in Joshua, but also in the competing religious visions of this God Yahweh who will take over the land from the indigenous population, worshiping El, Baal, and Astarte. Against this in, uh, indigenous Canaanite model, it could be argued that Israel constantly claimed that it was not from Canaan. Uh, the prophet Amos in chapter 9, verse 7 declares, Did I not bring Israel up from the land of Egypt, the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Arameans from Kir? But then this is matched by Ezekiel 16.3, which Bill Deaver quoted yesterday. 
Your ancestry and birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. Might these counterclaims betray a more complex weaving of traditions? You have the indigenous Canaanites who were the bulk of the hill country population. Among them were outside groups who brought with them a belief in Yahweh. Despite Moses' rhetoric in Deuteronomy, one gets the feeling from the biblical text that we are not dealing with the pristine Israel who entered Canaan and suddenly decided to sin against God by continuously falling into all these forbidden Canaanite practices. These beliefs were deeply rooted amongst the population because the religion of Canaan was the only religion they knew. Even a person like Gideon is a likely candidate for a Canaanite who may have later become a Yahwist, although given the later theological shape of these stories by the Deuteronomist and later writers, it's difficult to discern how these stories may have been co-opted for religious reasons. At some point in the life of the monarchy, when Yahwistic names began to appear more commonly in personal names, is when Yahwism appears to gain ascendancy, even though many in the population never abandoned their traditional beliefs or saw any difficulty in syncretizing Yahwism with their traditional religion. And I'll end it with that. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for some questions. Yisrael? It's not a question. I wish to uh, thank you very, very much for this uh, extremely interesting uh, presentation. I wish to support you regarding uh, the climatic uh, crisis at the end of the late Bronze Age. In the capacity of this uh, uh, large European Research Council uh, project that uh, I have conducted together with the uh, uh, Steve Weiner and 45 scholars from different um, fields, uh, Daphna Langut, a palynologist, uh, checked uh, two cores of sediments from the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, and there is clear evidence there for a climate uh, problem, crisis. Uh, this is the first time that such an investigation uh, has been conducted in good resolution and with regular, rigorous control over radiocarbon dating. So we know that our dates are correct, I think. And <laughs> the, I hope, gotta qualify I hope. <laughs> and the, the uh, crisis is between around 1250, the middle of the 13th century, and 1100 BC. Now, of course, I mean, this has been in literature for a while now, and this is corroborated by uh, palynology investigations in Anatolia, in Ugarit, in the Delta, and so on. The interesting point here is that we have three different uh, uh, sets of data which uh, go together very well. The evidence uh, for climatic uh, crisis as uh, emerging from our work in the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea points to 1250 to 1100. If you take the evidence for unrest in uh, Canaan, it's also in the same period of time. If you go from Chatzor uh, to Megiddo, let's say something like that. Mm -hmm. And please note that if somebody, if, if, if we assemble all the evidence from the ancient Near Eastern text, they appear for the first time. There is uh, the famous appeal of a queen of Hatti in the middle of the 13th century, uh, giving the first indicator for a problem for drought and famine in the north. And it started in the north. And the latest uh, pieces of evidence are either in Egypt in the time of uh, uh, the 20th dynasty, uh, material that, has been, uh, that was assembled long ago by Cherny in an article which he published in 1933 about rising uh, food prices in Egypt in the 12th century BC. So all this, and a little bit later maybe also, so all this uh, information uh, goes together and there is no question mm -hmm. that you're right on this. Now, the point here, and this is the last sentence that I wish to say, the point is that this was definitely involved with the movement of large groups of people because of this phenomenon of drought and famine. Mm -hmm. And it apparently all started in the north. The key is to look at what's going on in Anatolia. Now, a book, and this is a recommendation and my last note, a book has recently been published by uh, Ronnie Ellenblom from the Hebrew University under the title, uh, The Collapse of the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, 950, uh, 1070 AD, uh, CE. This is a book on a major climatic event, well documented, 
by Arab historians uh, that happened in the late 10th century and 11th century BC. And you can see that part of the problem was not the lack of precipitation. The major problem was uh, uh, the cold weather in the northern parts of the Near East, in northern Anatolia, in these regions. And this brought about destruction of, of uh, agricultural output and movement of people to the south. So this is part of the same question. Thank you, Israel. That's great. Yeah, and I, I would just like to add that I agree with your um, bringing the Shasu nomads into the picture because if there was a climatic crisis, uh, you know, at the end of the 13th century to the 10th century, that those same processes that Yisrael mentioned for the north could certainly operate in this small uh, area. And from our own excavations in southern Jordan in the Fainan area, we've identified what we believe is a Shasu cemetery um, with a large group of nomads living at this time that, you know, one of the graves even had a Hyksos uh, scarab in it, so it shows like a long-term movement between uh, the Nile Delta and and our region in southern Jordan, which suggests another kind of model for perhaps the rise of uh, ancient Israel at that time. Did you have a, any other comments? Okay, well, uh, Ron Handel. I just want to ask, that was a beautiful talk. Brought together a lot of things very elegantly. The, the, you, you, you used the term dissolution model. Yeah. That's a nice term. Who, did, did you yeah, invent that? Uh, to be honest with you, I can't remember who I first read that used this term, but it captivated it so well, yeah. you know, that I thought um, it really pulled together a lot of um, what scholars have been talking about, so I like that term. I think you invented it. <laughs> it's very good. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Okay.